love, and I remember the picture of her in the uh, beach queen, and she, her, her beauty was just as, uh, as I recall. So anyway, tonight that uh, we're going to, Tony was here uh, at, uh, at the last meeting to talk about the his, uh, railroad career and uh, so forth, and tonight that his emphasis is going to be a little bit more on the early times in history as well as the, uh, the Cree family history, which is very interesting, and uh, I won't steal any of his thunder there. But uh, for those of you who... No, go ahead, go on, we'll eat some more food. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, doing great, really. <laughs> no, I, no, I don't think so. I don't think, I hear you're pretty good. Uh, but anyway, yes. just to say a few words about uh, Tony, that uh, he graduated from uh, St. Augustine Prep, uh, Lincoln Community College. He has been in the broadcasting and entertainment in the past 21 years. And, uh, and also in his uh, uh, occupation as uh, in the rail industry, and uh, he is now founder, owner, CEO, and president of the Cape Jay Future Life. And uh, you all recall that, uh, that uh, Irma, we call, we have that picture of you in the red hat, that, that uh, we had the, the, the group had a uh, visit to Future Life. I'll tell you all about that. But uh, it's really uh, great to have uh, Tony back. Um, and uh, so with that, I will introduce uh, Tony Gray. Okay. Nice intro. I hope I can live up to that. <laughs> I don't know where to stand when I do these things, because I'm always feeling like I'm putting my wrong side, maybe it's my better side, I don't know. Uh, well, welcome everybody, thank you very much for inviting me back. We did have a lot of fun, uh, was it two years ago already? Uh, was six months ago, God. Uh, yeah, it was, it was fun, and we're, it's, it's, what we're going to do is like laid back, very relaxed, very informal, sometimes silly, but uh, that's what we're here for, to have some fun. And as I look around the room, I, I want to say one thing. Welcome to Ladies' Night at the Historical Society. <laughs> I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Nice job, really. Thank you. Um, let me tell you what we're going to do. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff I did, uh, kind of a fascinating life and career. I look back on it, and I'm like, man, where did all those years go? But uh, then what I also did was, I spent, I spent about two hours over the weekend. I waited till the last minute. I worked best under pressure. Uh, looking through between my mom and my Aunt Jeanette, I looked through two boxes of photographs. Each box was that big, full of, I mean, just, just dynamic stuff. I mean, and I'm, I'm like, yes, 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 no, 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 yes, no. I did, you know, I don't want to bore anybody, of course, but there's some, there's some really interesting stuff. Uh, my mom used to tell me, they had like 10 kids in their family. Uh, I don't even think they owned the camera. So it must have been either one of her girlfriends or one of her sisters or something. But maybe if, if you invite me back again, I guess it all, it all depends how good I do tonight, right? Uh, if you invite me back, we could try to do a program. My mom has, like I said, a box full of photos. And it's fascinating because it's like, like, like her and her girlfriends like on Bellevue Avenue and the popular spot I was telling Bill yesterday seemed to be back in, now we're talking, um, so my mom was born in 22, 1932, 42, the war years. The popular spot seemed to be the, uh, the Veterans Park next to the Presbyterian Church with a monument. She has a lot of photos there. Her and her girlfriends and all kids around and laughing. The Hamilton Lake seemed to, yeah. The, the, the Ram thing there. Right, yeah. And seat. you can see the press, yeah, you can see the Presbyterian Church in the background. The Hamilton Lake seemed like, an, but I don't, I can't ask my parents because they're both deceased, but there's so many people in these photos. And I just like to, I like to put them up and say, okay, tell me, tell me who you think these people might be. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of stuff. Um, I lived here all my life. Uh, I went to St. Joe Grammar School. I was scared to death of nuns, so I, I did pretty well because I saw them. I saw them. I saw them in action, uh, which was a good thing to be honest with you. I mean, that's why things are the way they are today. But that's another story. Uh, but yeah, I went to St. Joe Grammar School. We lived at the Marjorie Apartments until I was about 16 years old. I went to St. Joe Grammar School. Getting back real quick. Some of these. Uh, 
I do remember some of the names, but I'll I'll just keep them to myself. But some of these names were like halfbacks, fullbacks, quarterbacks. <laughs> I mean, they were like we were little kids, and they were like gigantic. I mean, so we never fooled around except for maybe uh, every once in a while we go into the bathroom and we get. Um, I remember we got toilet paper and we wet the toilet paper and we would throw it up and let it stick to the ceiling. And myself and Frank Raza, who was now my attorney, him and I were in there one day and we're like, throwing these things up. There's a whole ceiling loaded with toilet paper standing right next to us as a nun. And she's like, can I go next? And it was, it was just it was one of those funny things, you know? Then another time, every time she turned around and right on the blackboard, we had a ball and they would like throw it across the room and then freeze real quick. So when she turned around, there was no ball. Then, then after I guess three or four days of that, she kind of got smart and turned halfway, and the ball went flying right out the door. So we got in trouble for that. But uh, <laughs> trouble in those days pff, was nothing. I mean, you know, talking in school, throwing balls around the class. Uh, I left. I graduated at uh, St. Joe Grammar School, and my parents I didn't quite understand this, but I guess it worked out. My parents uh, wanted me to go to St. Augustine. And I gotta tell you, when I found that out, I hated every second of it. I mean, I wrote my parents, I apologize later on, but I wrote my parents, I hate letter, you can't do this to me, all my friends are at St. Joe, I love St. Joe, you're taking me away from my friends. I wasn't really thinking about the education part of it, not that, not that St. Joe is not a good education, but they just wanted to, I guess they just wanted a different environment for me. And even, I remember, I was really like into sports at the time, like baseball, basketball, football. I remember Steve Salvo, he was a coach at St. Joe. He even came over to my house a couple times. We lived at, we were still living at the Marjorie Apartments. And he's like, Mr. and Mrs. McCree, the school needs, they called me Anthony back then, but Tony's like a later day thing. But uh, the school needs him, he's a good ball player, and blah, blah, blah. And he begged my, I, I, I think he came over like three or four times begging my parents. and. Uh, it just didn't work out. So off I went to St. Augustine, and you know, like when you're in seventh and eighth grade, you start noticing that there's girls in class, you know? Like today it must be third or fourth grade, but back then, it was, back then it was seventh and eighth grade. And you know, then I started liking some of the girls in class, and I'm like, damn, it's eighth grade, I'm just getting started here. Uh, Uncle St. Augustine was more boys. Well, my parents told me in one of the times they sat me down, I said, look, this is where you're gonna go, they said, but there's a girls' school right down the road. Well, I didn't know it was 15 miles down the road. <laughs> Our Lady Mercy Academy, yeah, it was down the road away. But I, the way they told, I thought we could go hang out there at lunchtime with the girls and stuff, you know. But uh, no, it didn't work out. But anyhow, we had, after, it, it took a while to get used to it. St. Augustine was pretty tough. Um, the whole school was about, let me just say this, if you had a good arm, you could have threw a baseball from one end of the school to the other. That's how small. I mean, I came from St. Joe where they had a nice gym, nice basketball courts, great baseball field. Uh, um, I will tell you one of my favorite stories about St. Augustine. I guess it was my first week there. We went out and they said, okay, we're going to go play softball. And remember, you're like, you're like with kids. Well, there was, there was three kids in my, two kids in my class from Hamilton. Alex Rohde and Don Vaughn, who is now Dr. Vaughn. So we were just, we were, you know, we were tight together because we didn't know who these other people were. So uh, I remember the coach said, okay, we're gonna go play, we're gonna go play softball. So we're like, okay. So we walked out of the side of the school. <clears throat> I'll never forget this as long as I live, it's a good story. Uh, we walked out of the side of the school and we're carrying, you know, the softball and the gloves and the bats and all that kind of And we're walking and walking and, you know, I'm looking, I'm like, man, this, I can't wait to see this baseball field, man, this has to be great. Then we're walking and walking. Finally, we stop, like the weeds are this high, honest to God. And the coach goes, all right, this is home plate. And this is what he's dug it. I'm telling you, the, honest, the weeds were like up to our knees. And that was, um, that was our first experience at, uh, at playing uh, sports at St. Augustine. But I will say this. I was just invited to be on the uh, Alumni Association, which I thought, that's pretty cool. I like that. I like that. Because now I forgot all the bad stuff, so now I want to go back and I think I might still have a homework assignment or two. <laughs> but I went there for the first time a month ago. If you've never been there, I mean, this is like this is like uh, a university. And it's just unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. I mean, the school I went to was about that big versus this big right now. It's, 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 a, it's a pretty impressive place. 
But uh, after the first year, I uh, I figured, well, look, I better do good here because I'm here. They're not gonna they're not gonna send me back to St. Joe, and uh, I I did well. I, I I did pretty good at St. Augustine. Got accepted to uh, a couple real good colleges. Uh, I applied at St. Joe and, and over in Philadelphia. I got accepted at Villanova. But a real a real life changing experience happened in. Uh, February of 71, my dad passed away, uh, my senior year in high school, which I, I gotta tell you, it was pretty ugly. It was, it was just a rough time. Uh, he had only been sick from the time they found out he was sick to the time he passed away, I guess it was uh, eight, nine months. And I had to watch him every day just deteriorate pretty rapidly. Uh, he was 51 years old. Not to mention that we just moved into a brand new house. We were only there like maybe a year and a half. So what I did was I backed all those plans for leaving the area. My mom, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, all of, all of for the, you know the kids and stuff. So she kind of needed some help, even though she insisted that she didn't. Uh, she was a pretty strong woman. So I ended up <clears throat> not that it was a bad thing. I went to Atlanta Community College because it was close. Um, and at the, <clears throat> at the time, let me back up one more time. Then we'll get into some good stuff. I'm not, I just want you to know where I'm coming from, where I've been, one or the other. Uh, I was playing in a, uh, I played in a rock band. I played lead guitar for about six, seven years. And one of the members of the band was Phil Chiaflo. I don't know if you're gonna know him. He was Dr. Chiaflo's son. He was the one that was killed in the airplane uh, crash. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because we used to practice and practice and practice. I'll never forget, every night of the week we'd be practicing. Uh, I guess at one time we thought maybe we were going to be the next Beatles or something like that. Every, every rock band does, you know? So we did a couple dances right over here at St. Martin's Church where we were like the host band where we invited a disc jockey from WFIL Radio in Philadelphia, which at the time, WFIL was really a band. I don't know if anybody remembers it, but uh, Famous 56 WFIL. So we invited the disc jockey down, and uh, I think we did four or five dances. He brought like Billy Horner, who, had, who was a famous recording artist, and I mean we packed him in. I'll never forget. We looked outside. There were there was kids lined up in the parking lot waiting to get. And those were the days. That, that was really that was really a good time. But the reason I bring that up is, I guess after the third or fourth dance, I got to be good not good friends with this disc jockey, but. I was kind of hanging out with him. I said, hey, you know, I really like music and blah, blah, blah. I said, do you ever need any help at WFIL Radio? I said, I know it might be a long shot. And he said, yeah, kid, here's my card, and uh, give me a call sometime. So about a year or so went by, and I actually called this guy, and he invited me up to the radio station. And to make a long story short, I was hired there on a part-time basis while I was still a senior in high school. Uh, that was in 1971. I was the youngest person they ever hired. Because I was really into, I mean, besides training, I was, bless you, bless you. I was really into music and, and uh, that kind of thing. So I stayed at WFIL Radio for about 11 years, 71 to 82. And if you invite me back, I'll do a whole story on like who I worked with. And oh my God, it's just, just. I look at that now. I look back at that now, and I'm like, did that really happen? Because it all went so quick. It was, it was just a quick period. Uh, but met some incredible people. Like I remember recording commercials with Frank Rizzo, and we did some stuff with Dick Clark, and it, the list goes on and on. But I left there because it was an AM radio station. And AM radio back in the late 70s, early 80s was really, really going down. FM radio was, was the deal. Uh, the station was sold, it became a country and western station, nothing against country and western music, but everybody was leaving and I had got a couple job offers. One of the disc jockeys named George Michael, he was a real popular guy, he went to ABC in New York. He wanted me to go to work there with him and I probably should have, but I, I for some reason I didn't. But I thought to myself, geez, here I am, it's 1982, 71, 82, 11 years, what the hell am I going to do? So. I went to saw a friend of mine up in Pennsylvania who owned the railroad. And I went to saw him and I said, hey Jim, how about it? what do I have to do to get a job at the railroad? He said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be, I like to be a train engineer. He's like, everybody wants to be a train engineer. I mean, like, whoa, he's like, everybody wants to be a train engineer. I said, ah, oh, take it easy. But then he explained to me, he said, look, 
I'll hire you, you can come to work with me, but before you get to become a train engineer, you gotta start working on the track. I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in. So I guess about two or three days later, I went up there and I worked on the track for, in the track, put railroad ties in, I guess for about three years, until I finally got elevated into learning how the, the trains operated and all that kind of stuff. But I wasn't a real big guy, and uh, it was tough work, but again, I was in my 20s. So, uh, you know, you could do a lot that then. Well, you think you could do a lot anyway. Let me back up. Um, when I worked for WFIL, I was what you call an engineer and producer. See, big radio stations, and I'll, I'll do a program on this sometime, and it's kind of fascinating. At the big radio stations, like WFIL, they're called top 40 stations. Um, there was two separate rooms where the disc jockey was in one room, the guy that talked on the air, and the engineer producer, which was what I was, we were in another room. There was a big glass window, and we talked through, a, through an intercom. And what he would do is, through a whole series of numbers like J25, 1027, 622, the whole wall had all the uh, all the songs on. They were on cartridges, mm -hmm. sort of like an eight-track uh, uh, cartridge. That's how all the music was. So I would get as fast as I could. I get the whole hour set up with all the commercials, and he would we would talk through an intercom, and he'd cue me, and I'd hit the button. And it was cool because uh, at your fingertips was like thousands and thousands of listeners. People listen as soon as you hit that button. It was like instant song on the radio. It was a, it was a real re rewarding position, but the point I'm making is not only did I do the studio work, there was a, I guess it was seven or eight of us engineers, um, but I was the only guy that did the mobile work. We did a lot of what we called mobile work, like high school dances and, and clubs and bars, I don't say bars, lounges and stuff like that. I used to go to work in the daytime, like maybe 10 to 2 in the afternoon or 10 to 4 in the afternoon. From here to City Line Avenue, I would leave there, drive home, take a shower, load all the audio equipment, by the way, was mine. The radio station didn't know any. I, I purchased it myself, uh, which I still, I still do that kind of work, too. Uh, I would come home, take a shower, load all the audio equipment in my van, drive all the way back to Philadelphia and work for another six, seven, eight hours. And I look back at that now, I'm like, what the hell was wrong with me? I mean, it was, don't get me wrong, it was fun, and honestly, this was the 70s, and the money was pretty good uh, on the scale of what things were back in the 70s. I mean, if you, if you made $200 a week, you were doing, you're doing pretty good. Uh, but that's some of the stuff I did, I really enjoyed it, and uh, again, I could, I could probably do a program a year and pick up a different topic every single time. So, uh, let's, let's try to move forward now. Um, just a little background. The railroad, I'll save a little bit of that for when we get into the photos. But growing up in Hamilton, i tell you what I did. I made some notes here. I started doing this about two years ago. I called it, these are a few of my favorite things. She said, somebody ought to make a song out of it. <laughs> uh, but i tell you why I did this, because I'm like, geez, maybe someday, maybe I'll lose my memory and forget all this good stuff. <laughs> but with my luck, I'll probably have a good memory, and my, I'll lose my eyesight, and I won't be able to see what I wrote down, you know? But uh, there was two or three things I want to share with you, and, and feel free to jump in, and maybe, maybe by what I'm talking about, it'll, like, it'll kick in your memory or something. Um, I'll tie this in with a photo I have, too. My grandfather, rest his soul, Frank McCree, he would, um, he would pick me up at school almost every single day. He was retired. And we would go to a place called the Ed Dolores Market. The building is still there. It's, on a, it's like on Railroad Avenue and Fairview Avenue. And he knew the, you know, all those people knew each other. They all came over on the same road and all that stuff. We would go there, and I'll never forget, he would purchase, get me a box of vanilla, vanilla wafers, which I still eat to this day. And every time I eat a box of those, I'm thinking of my grandfather. We would go there, and we would sit there, because, because it was next to the railroad track, we would, um, we would sit there and watch trains go by, and I guess that was the early beginnings of my uh, my love affair with railroads and trains. Uh, another thing I remember fondly is um, I don't know why, but there's there's something that sticks out in my mind. The Hamilton Mart. I don't know why. I used to love going to that place. That was like the place to go shopping, you know. And especially at Christmas time, because. As I remember, you walked in the front doors and there were Christmas decorations, and it was real big and real long. If, if you've ever been here, you know what I'm talking about. 
But outside they had speakers, and I'm telling you, I could I could close my eyes and hear this. I associate two songs with the Hamilton Heart. Rockin' around the Christmas tree and Jingle Bell Rock. If, if, if I heard that once in the Hampton Mart, I heard it a million times. And uh, there was a guy there who my father knew. They used to sell Christmas trees in front of the Hampton Mart. His name was Joe Spado. Short little Italian guy. Always had a cigar sticking out of his mouth. And I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing here, this was a scene from that, from that movie, A Christmas Story. It was a yearly tradition. My father would get into it. I don't mean like an argument, but they get into this negotiating session over Christmas trees. And my mother would be like, come on, buy the Christmas tree, it'll fry. And my, my father would say, like, Joe, what do you want for this one right here? This is the one the kids like. And he, he'd be talking with that cigar out of the corner of his mouth and be like, ah, give me, uh, give me seven bucks for it. Ah, uh, seven bucks, can you do five? What the hell do you think I am? Do you want to make Christmas trees here? Seven bucks, seven bucks. Ah, look, we've been friends for many years. All right, six fifty. It was great. I mean, they went through this whole ritual every single Christmas right in front of the Hamilton Mart, right, like he was set up right where he walked in. And I'll tell you what else I remember, and thank God I didn't forget any of this stuff. He had like a, the things you see in the orange groves, like a smudge pot to keep warm, and he could, he could have felt the heat from that, and the smell of the Christmas trees, and I'm telling you, life couldn't have been better for a little kid. Trust me, it was just, it was just a page from Carrier and I, I mean it. Um, can I interrupt her? I used to remember, yeah, I feel free to say something. Riding my bike there to, to buy, and me and my friend, and we would buy records and comic books. Do you remember that? Yes, I do remember that. Yep, 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 I remember that. And they had all these bins set up with little toys where you could buy like a little toy truck for like 25 cents, you know? And it's just, uh, just some great stuff. Um, just have a few other things here that uh, I think you might find uh, really interesting. Hamilton Moore, uh, riding our bicycles to Deer Park Bakery, where you could we pull all our money together and buy a box of cookies and go sit by the railroad tracks and watch trains go by. Does anybody remember the Mill, Mills Playhouse? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I just went by there. There's a detour on Pleasant Mills Road. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, with my Aunt Jeanette, who Bill talked about, um, I went there one year, I'll never forget this. God only knows what year it was. It had to be had to be the early 60s, we saw The Wizard of Oz. They did a play there. And all I can remember is, when we walked in, my aunt was holding me by the hand, and she said, watch where you walk. Because, am I right? Yeah. The floor the floor had like holes in the floor. There was water. Yeah, there was water. <laughs> the floor. It was like, today, today, they would have been, it would, with the craziest things are upset, they would have been shut down a million times. Get down, pulled those, blown up. Um, but yeah, we'd walk in and she'd be like, okay, follow me. And we'd be like, we'd be dodging holes in the floor. And that was water. I mean, oh my God. I mean, just, it, it was kind of a fun experience, but you know, you look back on that stuff and, um, oh, I got a good one. Um, yeah. Very nice, very nice. I, I drove by a week ago and I, I kind of like paused. There's no real shoulder there, but I wanted to like look more. And I'm like, God, I can't believe this place is still here, which was a good thing. Uh, at Christmas time, um, I guess for about five years, let me take a guess, late 50s, early 60s, the big thing was Aunt Jeanette, who you'll see a little bit in a minute, and her sister, Marie, they used to take me to New York. Uh, at Christmas, and that's another thing that, that is near and dear to my heart. I mean that we would we would drive to Trenton and take a train from like Trenton into New York, and it was for a little kid it was gigantic. I mean, we'd be standing on the big Pennsylvania Railroad electric locomotive would pull in, and uh, it, it was just we go and I tell you where we go. We go to F A O Schwartz, mm -hmm. the famous toy store. And uh, I still have a couple of the catalogs that I saved, but we would do that, and, and I'll tell you why I'm bringing the story up. We would maybe go to Macy's or Radio City Music Hall, and they, I guess they did it while I was young enough to appreciate it, because then after a while, you get to be an older kid, and then you start looking at things like that as being corny, you know? But I go to New York about three or four times a month now, because I still have some relatives, and I have a lot of friends there. And what I do is I drive from here to the train, train station, and even though the station was just recently remodeled, if you go down where you board the train on the, on the platforms, there's still the old original turn of the century, 1920, 
And I'm telling you, I just did this two weeks ago. I stand there and I can still see Aunt Marie and Aunt Jeanette standing there saying, here comes the train. Here comes the train. I don't know, maybe that's what keeps you young. Maybe you have to do stuff like that, you know? So uh, just a couple memories. I hope that, uh, and look, feel free to jump in or make a comment or tell me to shut up or something like that. Um, let's get on. I have, I'll tell you what I did. I went through a whole bunch of photographs. I took them with me. I took the photos with me only because if someone wants like a specific date, I could look real quick if, if, if you're that, you know, enthused about it. Um, and these are transparencies, and, and they're, not, they're not quite the same as looking at a photo, but they're close. I didn't realize uh, that it's not like a slide where the slide actually projects what you see on the slide on the wall. But I tell you what, let's give it a try, and um, we'll look at some really neat photos of some members of the family. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a few stories I need to get to yet, and uh, we'll take it from there. Um, lights, please. I'm going to do this. So. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to stand in anybody's way. I hope you guys are having a good time, because to me this is like talking to family. You know, it really is. I'm enjoying this. I really am. Um, if you can't see, I'll, 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 that's my mom and dad, and, uh, guess what, that is a, that is a, that is a, thank you for saying that, because I, I, I felt stupid saying it, because I'm like, I'm not here to, prom like, to promote my mom and dad. You know? <laughs> she took her picture to White Hall one day, and I told her that, and she said, everybody told her that. My mom, this is the God's honest truth, my mom had a picture of Rita Hayworth, and she put it on a table. My mom was a pretty laid back lady, but, but hey, look, you got it, you it, you know? Uh, she put a photo of Rita Hayworth next to a photo of her, and she said, there was no photo caption, but she said, which one is me, and I'll tell you what, he had a hard time figuring out who, who was really who. And this was obviously taken at some club or something like that, but uh, that's my mom and dad. My mom, I said, was, she was like one of about 10 kids. They had the same father, but two mothers. She was from, she was from the second mother. Some of her brothers and sisters were from the first mother. That's why there was a big age difference. Some of her sisters were like 20 years older than her. So that's what my mom. What's her name? Valentina. You know, it's funny, I look, at, I look at a photo like this, two pretty good, reasonable, decent-looking pe people, and I'm like, what the hell happened to me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we're yeah. wondering that, too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> I know those guys just ignore that. <laughs> now, remember, I have to go photo by, I have to go photo by photo here, because uh, this is not like a slideshow. Now, I threw a couple other ones in. Because you might rec I have no idea who these people are, but you might recognize them, and if you do, please tell me. This is, this is right before my mom got married in January of 49, and the photo date is like, oh, it's Christmas Eve 48. Mm. And that's, that's my mom right there. That sounds familiar, yeah. The baby, the first one. The first one, right a right. she's up in her 90s now. Yeah. Wow. I don't know, but it certainly looked. She was at Grasso. She was at Grasso. <clears throat> I believe my mom worked in. Um, what's it? What's it called now? It's a Jim Hamilton. Jim Hamilton. You know, right there on the uh, Passmore in Washington. Oh, it's a factory. Oh, factory. Yeah, I think that's where that picture was taken. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. That's yeah. 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 Right. One of them looks like it could be a Seattle trio. The yeah, second one. Yeah, they look the like second from the. Where is she seated? It looks like some kind of pedal at the, the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 they must have gave her some kind of. Uh, she yeah. her wedding shower. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But it says here, American Safety Shades. Yeah, it's a table first one. Is that what's her machine where she worked? I don't know about that. I'm telling you, I don't know. Those shoes, ladies. I welcome the input. They're in style now. Yeah. You see that? They should have saved them. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, feel free to make feel free to make comments. Seriously. All right. I don't know who these people are either, but this is um somebody's, somebody's wedding. Yeah, this is my that's my mom right here. I have no idea. Even if I don't even know if they're from around here. But, uh, I'm guessing probably uh, 46, 47. I don't know who it is, but pretty hands. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what? I, and I mean this is a compliment. There was something very oh, unique. Nice. Yeah, very unique look is the way girls and ladies looked. Uh, I don't know what it is, but it's but I like it though. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like dresses. Like it. yeah. 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 Dresses. Uh, dresses. I'm all in for dresses. <laughs> yeah. There's not enough dresses today, I'm serious. I know I like my dress shop went out. <laughs> okay. This, uh, this is my aunt Jeanette uh, McCree. This is who Bill was talking about. The photo is a lot better than this. I guess that's when she graduated uh, graduated uh, high school, probably. Um, she older or younger than your mom? Let's see. She, was, she just passed away. Um, Three years ago, she died in 2006. She was born in 16. My mom was born in 22. Six years. Uh, again, I, I threw a lot of these in, not just because it was a family member, but maybe, maybe recognize some of the other people. Mm. This is somebody's. I think, I think it's a. I think it's a shower or something. The information is on the uh, on the photo. Give me a second, I'll get this photo down. Do you recognize me? Which is your mom? That uh, was my aunt in this one. Oh. Uh, Jeanette, she's right. Third one on the left? Right there. No, that one? Oh, I thought it was nice. And I, just so you know, we called her, we called her Aunt Jay because as a little kid, I couldn't say Jeanette. <laughs> <laughs> Is that in somebody's house? I guess it is. Here's what it says on the bottom of the photo. Amelia Sasato's shower given by the Stella Maris Club. Yeah. 1936. That's, that's, that's all it says. Uh, yeah, if anybody, I, I don't know who's who here, but uh, it was probably in somebody's house, I would think. Yeah, what was the uh, spell? Yeah, yeah. I remember younger, but I can't tell you. Yeah. I never yeah. I know. I remember two Then, uh, several years later, I don't know exactly how it happened. But she met John D'Augustino, whose family owned Renault Winery. And they eventually got married. And that's that's him right there. I would guess this photo is probably, let's say, she was born in 16, 26, maybe like 1938, 1940, maybe. 20, she maybe 22, 23, 24. And you never thought something in the mid-way giant. She always wore her hair like that. Right, exactly. She was right. very beautiful. Up until she passed she away, she wore it. She kind of scared me because like, she was really beautiful. Yeah, and you know what? She was. I'm not what. saying she wasn't nice, but I was no. a little kid. I was a there was there's two words that I associate with her. And I'm, I'm not saying this because she was my aunt, but what class and dignity. Oh, very she, she was classy. A very, yes. Yeah, you know, but but she was modest. She didn't like. She was, she was, throw she her was around. beautiful. Uh, I, I can remember her. I can remember her the 16th of July working at the stand alongside her. Yeah, how about she that? Come out. Thank you. I, religious, I, the religious articles. Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay. I appreciate these memories too, by the way. I didn't know she was your mom. I remember no, no, she was she was my dad's sister. I was a lot younger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell me, would Matt have been his brother? Matt yeah, the engineer, that was yeah. uh that was I believe it was. Okay. I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know I knew Matt. Right, yeah, he uh yeah, I remember he told me that. Now Too bad you can't. It's not a great. The photo is good, but the copy is not. But this is her and her husband. Uh, Boardwalk to Broadway. I left 
John D. Augustino, president of L.A. Trinault, sons, bottles, and fine wines and champagnes, seen with Mrs. D. Augustino, the Stork Club in New York. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, a, I tell you what, I, I, I wasn't born yet when, I, when all this stuff was going on, but it was like, it was like a magical time from what I, from what I heard. It was, it was um, pretty serious stuff. They had, um, they had a house at Renault Winery. Then they had another house, which I remember going to. They had a house in Ventnor. I forget, maybe on Atlantic Avenue. Really nice house. And I don't have the details, but next time I come back, we'll, we'll do some more research. Uh, they had been happily married for several years. They were coming. They were coming home to Hamilton one morning. I think it was a Sunday morning. Coming up. What's that? Deer Street or Mossmo Road? Deer. Okay, I never. I one. The back road from yeah. like. Deer Street. Yeah, yeah. They were coming. They were coming towards Hamilton. I think from the winery, and two guys ran a stop sign and broadsided them, and they were both ejected from the car. I think he maybe lived a day or two, and she she almost died too. She was in pretty bad shape. Uh, but my brother, I just talked. I've been talking to him for the last three or four days. They, my aunt and my, I guess my grandfather and everybody, kind of, they have a book. It's about this thick. It's all the newspaper clippings from the time of the accident to the time he passed away. I didn't realize this, but like it was a big deal. I, I guess he was bigger than I ever thought he was. I mean, it was like it was like local, local government officials pay tribute to John D. Augustino. I mean, it was just, it was incredible. Uh, but yeah, it was, a, it was kind of a sad, uh, sad ending to a really neat, uh, a really, because my brother, my, my uncle John and my father were kind of helping out there. And to make a real long story short, and I know the details, but it's not for this, this for this meeting anyway, but through some manipulative efforts, uh, my aunt basically ended up with nothing. It's, it's, it was a pretty, yeah, I mean, she really should have. She was his wife. I mean, did she uh, ever remarry? Yeah, she did. She got married many, many years later to a gentleman from Cherry Hill. Uh, and they stayed married until he passed away. But, uh, yeah, she, because a lot of people even today, hey, I guess your aunt ended up with, you know, what happened with Manol. Nah, there was some something weird went on there with his mother. And, and I'm not, I don't want to talk about anybody, but it was pretty ugly for a while. It was, it was, you know, lawyers and attorneys and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the Renault at the time had international problems. Oh, yeah, as far yeah, as yeah. Sparkling, sparkling wine. So, I was going to say something I forgot. Um, no, okay, I'll, I'll. I can remember when he died the, the funeral. You remember that? I'll tell you how I remember. My grandmother and grandfather were buried almost right across from out in the Buddha Center. Okay. I can remember my father taking us out, and there was nothing but four kids in the field. He laughed at the flowers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, my I brother just. Uh, Frank Sinatra sent something. I mean, it was really. Oh, oh, yeah. It was yeah. yeah. I'm going to get to that. I got, some, I got some good Frank Sinatra stuff. But I remember uh, that. Very good. I'll tell you what. He said, was it from a local, the August yeah, I think it was because one of them may still live on the Lambert's place. I'm not, maybe she passed away now, too. Uh, I don't know if it was a sister or the mo uh, mother has to be long gone. Um, they, uh, I, I have no idea who these photos are, who these people are around there. I think one is over here. Uh, there's a second one. There's a J. That's, that's him. Uh, and that could be Louise from here. Right here. Oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah, think you're yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, okay. I have no idea where this is, but uh, I have a good picture of that. Yeah, yeah. She was Yeah. Let me tell you what happened. About a year ago, I think they have a historian working there now, or somebody doing historical research for an old winery. Out of clear blue sky, they got a hold of my brother. Don't ask me how. And some girl called him and said, We are we are desperately desperately trying to find information on a Jeanette the Augustino and and my, my brother's like that's my aunt and the, this girl like freaked out she goes oh my god for years now we've heard about this Jeanette the Augustino we couldn't we couldn't find her so to make a long story real short my brother went down there and met with him 
and uh, my brother loaned them or gave them a couple duplicate photos. And I guess after all these years, six months ago, they have finally have a photo of, of her and John D'Augustino and Walt Weinman. So that's kind of fitting, you know, that uh, yeah. Yeah. that after all this, you finally got some kind of recognition out of it. I haven't been there to see it, but I want to go down and uh, and, and see what it's all about. They gave you a tour. This is, um, I don't know who these people are, except that's her, that's John. That woman, that first woman looks like Mrs. Henson. Right here? Yeah. I, I no. That's my Aunt Marie, that's her sister. I have no idea yeah, no, uh, where this, this person, these two people here are in a lot of the photos. I, I don't know if there may be Renault Winery people. Um, well, that's her sister right there, right in the second. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is, this is Marie right here. She's deceased also. I thought this was just a cool photo. Um, I don't really know where it was, but you can see you can see some buildings in the background here. This is uh, this is John D. Augustino right here. So maybe this was like the executives or the top brass or something like that. In the back, that's where they do the pilot. Yeah, I think those buildings are still there on the right side. Yeah. Yeah. A couple, couple good stories. Um, when my when my uncle John and my father were working there, they used to deliver. They had to go out and make deliveries. So one day, and these are all true stories. One day, uh, they told both of them. They said, "Look, you're going to go to New York. You're going to go to this address on Park Avenue. It's Joan Crawford's apartment." Okay. So they loaded. They loaded the. The wine in the, in the vehicle, and you know, um, and my father told the story, but my uncle had a better. Well, my dad passed away too young for me to really like ask him all the details, but Uncle Johnny knew the story pretty well. Anyhow, they went there expecting to find like the maid or a housekeeper or something. They went into this real big plush place, and uh, sure enough, the door opens. John Crawford. Mm -hmm. He's like, "Oh, we don't want to come on in." And my uncle said, "My father." Kind of like froze up. He couldn't believe. Like, <laughs> yeah, he said. He said. He said. You had to see your father. Well, he used the S word. He goes, your father almost S himself. He said. <laughs> he couldn't move. He was. He was staring at Joan Crawford. He's like, and she's like, and and they were just like, come on in. Can I get you? You guys came all the way from the land city. Can I get you something to drink? And they loaded all the uh, whatever she had ordered. But like Bill said earlier, it was a Renault was a pretty pretty big deal. Uh, and. I think it was Joan Crawford, Bob Hope, and it was somebody else, where they used to take, get a load of this, they used to take the wine and load it on a train at Grand Central Terminal. In other words, these people were influential enough to say, yes, I'd like, a, I'd like two cases of whatever, and could you please deliver them to the 20th Century Limited at Grand Central Terminal? And they had to go, and that's, that's what they did. I mean, it was just fascinating stuff, fascinating stuff. And, and, and she was in a, a, a negligee, supposedly, so to speak. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm, yeah, and I'm sure, I know it was a true story because Aunt Jay told us, but, but yeah, if, 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 if John was here right now, he'd tell you how they dated for six years. <laughs> but then he meant well, you know. Speaking of the devil, this is, uh, this has to be some kind of exhibit somewhere. There's Uncle John right there. There he is. Probably Mary and Bernal. I thought I thought it was a convention somewhere. Yeah, because I tell you why. Check, check this out. Gimbal Brothers was right next to the wall. Yeah, it's probably the Pacific. I don't They're selling. Yeah, they, uh, there was, um, 
I know this sounds kind of far-fetched, but believe me, it's true. My aunt, through John D'Augustino, through Skinny D'Amato of the 500 Club, and they also owned a place on the boardwalk called Sid Hartfields. It was like a real fancy restaurant in Atlantic City. I think the building is still there today, but it, it became like a hot, uh, Nathan's Hot Dogs. But uh, my aunt got to the point where she, she knew Frank Sinatra pretty well. And I'll tell you, she kept, I, I, there was only so much I could do for tonight's meeting, but the next time you invite me back, I'll be happy to do it. My aunt kept like a, I don't want to say a diary, but like a, a daily journal. journal. Yeah, that's a good word, journal, yeah. And um, she told us a story where Frank Sinatra would call her, and believe it or not, Frank Sinatra was at the house on 229 White West Pike probably like five or six times over the course of their friendship. And you know, back then, you know, like unlike today, they didn't run to the newspapers. It was all it was all low key. And you gotta remember there was no Atlantic City Expressway. A lot of these movie stars were definitely afraid of flying. So uh, I guess on his way to Atlantic City, my grandmother would say, Mr. Sinatra, come in. But here comes the best part, and this is a true story. I guess for maybe a period of six, seven, eight years, he would call my aunt to get him a deal on a Cadillac. He would, he would, I don't know why Frank Sinatra would need a deal on a Cadillac, but she, I guess, knew people through Renault. And you get to know a lot of people when you're in that situation. And he would talk to her, and I mean, I mean can you hear it? Hey, Jeanette. Hey, it's Frank. Hey, uh, yo, a 1957 uh, Cadillac sedan. What can you do for me? You know. And, uh, yeah, she hooked him up with whoever she knew, and uh, uh, she told that story right to the very end. She said, "Boy, if I only knew what I, if I only capitalized on what I knew then, I, we had Frank Sinatra stop on his way to Atlantic City." But there's a better story that I'm going to get to in a couple of seconds. But yeah, there's Rudy Valley and. Where, which house are we talking about on the White Horse Pike? The one next to you. So next Frank door? Sinatra was next door Absolutely. to my grandma. Yeah, at least, at least five or six times. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Pull in. You'd have somebody driving. Stop in. Talk to my aunt on his way to Atlantic City. On his way back from Atlantic City. He was like a, remember, if you didn't fly there or take a train, you were on the White Horse Pike. Yeah. He lived in Hoboken. I mean, that was his yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Frank Sinatra also was a gigantic. Gigantic train fan. He was nuts about trains. He built he built a train station in his backyard before he last lived in California. He built an actual train station, and in the I have photos of it by the way. In the train station, he himself modeled all the tracks and all the buildings around Hoboken where he grew up. So Frank Sinatra was nuts about like Lionel trains and train. He was a major train fan. Just so you know that. So I'm not the only nut around. <laughs> Now, the story gets better. There was another guy, gentleman, I should say, who uh, played kind of a prominent role in my aunt's, uh, in my aunt's life, and that was uh, band leader Sammy Kay. There he is. This is, and as sure as I'm sitting here, he, I told Bill this story a couple times, he was nuts about my aunt Jeanette. Crazy, nuts, wanted to marry her, uh, up until he died, I don't remember what year that was, but he would send her, my brother still has it, he would send her either a card or flowers, mostly a card, on, at Christmas and on her birthday. And he was also at the house several times. Uh, I don't know exactly where this picture was taken, but I think that's... Uh, they both look like your I think that's Louise right there. Does that look like Louise Bernier? No, no, no. Well, there's Uncle John right there. That's Aunt Marie, and there's, a, there's Aunt Jeanette. Bill, you would have had to stand in line. Well, let me tell you what happened. <laughs> let me tell you what happened. My grandmother, my grandmother messed it up. He, he had asked her to marry him, and my grandmother kind of like, yeah. and here's, here's the story, the true story. Well, you know, you'll never be home. You'll be living in New York, you'll be living in Florida, you'll be living out, in the, you'll be traveling with the band. Gee, what a terrible life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my grandmother didn't, didn't, you know, it was the days where all your kids have to be within a couple hundred yards of you, you know. Uh, she probably said, he's not Italian. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I'm saying, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, as sure as I'm sitting here, he was, he was crazy about her. 
everybody go to the Janet. Yeah, well, that, that's one thing she used, they used to upset her. He could never get her name spelled correctly. I thought she just learned a little bit. Now, here's a photo. Um, Why did I not spell her name? That was good. Now, was she a widow then? Yeah, yeah. John had already passed away. Yeah, he died uh, a year before my parents got married. Uh, Forty-eight. Okay. That's more how she looked when she came. But this, this photo is at the Silver Fox on the way first place. Oh, wow. You know, with the with the blue Cadillac. Yeah. Yeah. What is that? What is she saying there? Huh? Well, I have no idea, but I'm telling you what. I am so tempted to stop her. Really. Everybody I know can't yeah. see that. And she's still there. And I'll tell you what, I'm surprised. I'm surprised somebody like, like the Gazette or the Hamilton News hasn't picked up on that. Like, wouldn't you like to see a story about that place? I mean, I would. Yeah, everybody is in wonder. Yeah. What is it? It's, it's still open? Yeah, but that's... When he, when he came to the house one time, when he came to, to the house, that's where they went to eat at the, uh, at the Silver Fox. <laughs> and these are just a couple later date pictures, as you might, if you knew them, you'll remember them. Uh, that was uh, oh, so that was Jeanette right? <coughs> it says here, Easter Sunday at the Claridge. Mm. Yeah, Marie, Marie never, never got married. She just stayed home. She used to be with her a lot, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, how is, uh, how is Billy Brewerton? She refers to her as her aunt. One day I was at the Perry Long, which is beautiful Lennox, and she said, my aunt worked that for me for my wedding. I, I think it might have been through the Augustino. It wasn't through the McCree side, I don't, I don't believe. Uh, well, she came from around there. I just have a few more. This is, um, let me see if I can try not to cut. Fashion show at the Olympic <coughs> City Racetrack. Uh, I think there was a 1961, by the way. Okay, now some local flavor stuff, and we'll we're doing pretty good. Hopefully no one's bored yet. Now, how did I get interested in trains? Oh, that you? Yeah, it's me. When I was, when I was, when I was young and good looking. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me tell you a story about these trains. Let me tell you a story about these trains. I've been on eBay for five years now, trying to find they were plastic, all, all hooked together. They were maybe like this long. The engine was black, the, the tender was black, this was yellow, and the caboose was red. And uh, I have no idea where my mom got them. I, I can no longer ask her. But I think it's the next photo. Hang on a second. That was Walmart Street. Yeah, yeah that's the one that's point. Yeah. Well. My mom used to, uh, you, you can see it on a photo, but you can't see it here. There was a string tied around here to the front of the engine. And I would just, I would just ride around, <laughs> pulling this train, looking back to make sure they were still there. Uh, yeah. Two years old. You were two? Yeah. You were yeah. a big kid. Yeah, it was. Then, yeah. You didn't believe in track back then, did you? No, they, they, they ran pretty well on the side. Of the <laughs> did you still have them? No, I wish I did. I, I want this train so bad, I'm telling you. Tony, we need to put that on the website. Lois has them. Yeah, so you guys can make fun of me? Lois has them, she says. What? I have trains that like that. No, come on, they're plastic? Yeah, yeah. 
Get out of here. But she said her yellow was white. My yellow is white. Can, can I see him sometime? Sure, I have a red caboose. Oh my have, God! I have my white car. Are they for sale? Are they for sale? No. My dad, my dad gave my dad bought me those. Yeah. There's no way for me to I tell you, I tell you, I tell you one other, one other story. I want to say this was uh, I was about maybe uh, seven or eight years old, uh, early sixties. It was a Friday night. This is one of my favorite stories, and I'll tell you why. My mom never let me go. It was like my first venture out of the neighborhood. Like, remember how Friday nights were in town? They were like, it was like really crowded. It was a great place. Yeah, everybody great place. Likes socialized. Oh my God, it was great. Great, great, great. But uh, I'll never forget my dad. My dad used to work late on Friday nights at Himco. My mom didn't drive at the time. She learned how to drive after my dad passed away. Uh, it was a Friday night. And she said to me, you know what's weird? I can remember this like it was yesterday, but I can't remember what the hell I did yesterday. Uh, she said, how about we have pancakes? I'll make us some pancakes for dinner. And I was a little kid. She says, she sat me down in the kitchen in the Marjorie apartment, which was about this wide. She said, look, here's $10. She says, I'm going to trust you. I want you to go to Olivo's market and buy pancake mix. She says, bring me the change. She says, do not, she says, stay on this side of the street, because if you follow the third street, Olivos was on the same side after you went on to Central. Uh, she said, do not go anywhere else. Take the change back. I want you to go there, and I want you to come right back. So I go to Olivos Market. I buy the, she, she gives me the note, you know, the pancake. This, this is a God's honest truth story. I get the change. I come out of Olivos. I'm like, hmm, change. I have been checking out. I have been checking out a toy train engine in, in Newberry's for like every time we would go there. I would check out this engine. Okay? I, I tell you, it was silver and black, and it was it was like a tin. It, was, it wasn't like a Lionel piece. It was kind of like a chintzy thing, but I liked it. So I'm like, hmm, I'm really. I got change. I'm going. I'm going to buy that engine. That was a long ways from how much? Yeah, to go to go yeah, like the into corner. the center. Of, yeah, no, I'm serious, really. Oh, it must have been about two dollars, maybe, or something like that. I go there. Now, meanwhile, my mom is home, and she's freaking out. She's like getting real nervous. She doesn't want to call my father at work because she doesn't want to make him all nervous. But it should have took maybe maybe a half hour, or now like an hour. So she goes to our next door neighbor at the time, who was Frank Cortino. She goes to him, she says, I'm a nervous wreck. I sent Anthony in town. He should have been back. I don't know what happened to him. It's a Friday night, there's traffic, blah, 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 blah. So after after five minutes or so, he says, you're pretty nervous. Hop in my car, let's go look for him. They pull out of the Marjorie Apartments, they get maybe to about Cherry Street, where Cherry Street comes in. You know, I'm walking down the street, I got two bags in my hand. And my mother, my mother, rest her soul, loved to tell this story. She loved it, she told this. She says, you had one bag under your arm, that was a train engine. And had the other bag swinging, and that was the pancake mix. And uh, she, I'll tell you what, she was pissed. Really. Was, that's the maddest I've ever seen my mom get. She was, she was like a really laid back lady. She was a very sweet lady. But she got out, she got out of Frank Martino's car, and I mean, she didn't hit me enough. But she's like, "Do you know what you did to me? This is the first time I, I, I trusted you to go to town. You made me a nervous wreck. I couldn't call your father. I didn't want him to know. Blah 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 blah." Okay, later on. That night, she tells my dad what happened, and this was this was like stabbing me in the heart. The next morning, they drove oh, me to Newberry. Oh, 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 they oh, made me turn it. I can still see, I can still see where my father parked right in front of this street back then. They're like, "Go ahead," and I said, "You're going to do it yourself because you bought it yourself, and for your punishment, you're returning that." And I'll tell you what, but. God strike me dead if I'm exaggerating. From the time I walked, and if you remember, like the manager was like. He was way in the back, yeah. Like, yeah. like he was high up, like yeah, like, yeah. yeah. like he was.